is uh, the uh, first chapter. I'm actually going to I'm actually going to tackle two chapters today. Chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one's pretty short, but uh, I'll tackle the first two chapters. Uh, okay, biological psychology. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Biological psychology seeks to explain behavior in terms of its underlying physiology, its development, its evolution, and its function. A central premise of biological psychology is that bodily processes, particularly those of the nervous system, are the basis of all behavior. Biological psychology is multidisciplinary in scope and draws on knowledge produced in diverse scientific fields in an effort to produce integrated descriptions of the generation of behavior. Psychologists, biologists, physiologists, engineers, and neurologists all come together. It's multidisciplinary, which, is, which makes it kind of interesting because uh, American education uh, seems to be coming to be becoming more specialized. If you want to be a counselor, that's all you take. You take counseling classes. If you want to be a biologist, all you do is take biology classes. You don't take philosophy classes. Uh, in just in your undergraduate years, you take uh, a philosophy class, a history class, a sociology class. Uh, but some of us are multidisciplinary. We study many different things. And I am one of those individuals, a generalist. I, I have um, degrees in four different areas. Uh, I have an associate degree in medical laboratory technology. Uh, that's the um, laboratory portion of medicine, <clears throat> chemistry, urinalysis, hematology, uh, microbiology. So I have a lot of information in that area. I have med medical a medical background. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in English, so I'm an English teacher. I can correct your grammar, and I will. When you write a paper, I will correct your grammar. Probably won't correct your, uh, your postings unless they're pretty far off. Um, I have a master's degree in guidance and counseling, uh, psychology guidance and counseling. I also have a master's degree in international relations, which is a branch of political science. Uh, and uh, my PhD is in general psychology. So there you go. I've got degrees in four different areas. Um, so that makes me something of a multidisciplinarian, uh, if you want to look at it that way. But I have a lot of different ways of looking at things. Coming at uh, uh, one issue from a lot of different perspectives. And I think it makes it more interesting. I'm reading a book, well, I'm I'm reading a lot of books right now. <laughs> I've got one about economy. I just had an argument with a with a, an economist about uh, about capitalism the other day. Uh, so there you go. Biological psychology is fed uh, by a lot of different uh, uh, disciplines: immunology, uh, endocrinology, uh, molecular biology, developmental biology, anatomy, paleontology, evolutionary biology, anthropology. Cognitive science, computer science, psychiatry, neurology, physiology, and biochemistry. And they all feed into uh, biological psychology. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, does, if you're a biological psychologist, what does that mean? Does that mean you have all this information? The answer is no. You don't have all that information. You need to study each and every one of these in order to develop an expertise in that area. Did I put, oh, that's my that's what my second wife looked like. The reason I put this in, I don't know. I don't remember when somebody asked me what my second wife looked like, but that's what she kind of looked like. Uh, I, I I thought she was really attractive, but that's not her, of course. That's um, Catherine Mary Stewart or something. Yeah, Catherine Mary Stewart. I think is her name. But she looks just like my my second one. As funny as that is. Uh, okay, this requires analysis, uh, the observation at all, all possible levels. Uh, this requires analysis at many levels from molecular to macro activity, 
to interaction with the environment. And of course, all of these things need to be looked at. And this is one of the problems that we have with psychology. A lot of psychologists want to talk about the neurotransmitters. Some psychologists want to talk about what's going on in the individual. Uh, but can we really talk about neurotransmitters and what's going on with the individual if we're not talking about the individual in their, in their social environment? Uh, and, and of course, all of these can be a problem. If you're depressed, are you depressed because your serotonin level is low? Are you depressed because uh, you uh, just uh, uh, lost your dog? Uh, are you depressed because somebody's bullying you at school? I mean, there can be a lot of different reasons for uh, depression. Uh, one can have to do with, with uh, your neurotransmitter, the serotonin level. One can have to do with what's happening with you individually. You're, you've been depressed about losing your dog for the last six months. And the other can have something to do with a social situation like being bullied. Can we ignore any one of these three? And the answer is no. If you want to be a good psychologist, just because you're a, uh, a, a biopsychologist and you like to look at, uh, at uh, serotonin levels, uh, does that mean that that's the answer to your question, uh, to the problem? And the answer is going to be no, because you can raise this person's serotonin level but it's not going to bring the dog back, and it's not going to stop the bullying. If you stop the bullying, it's not going to bring the dog back. It's not going to raise the serotonin level, probably. Uh, so, you know, you have to deal with all three. Five viewpoints of biology uh, of behavior. You need to describe the behavior. You need to study the evolution of the behavior. You need to observe the development of the behavior and its biological characteristics over the lifespan. You need to study the biological mechanisms of behavior. You need to study applications of biological psychology, for example, dysfunctions, lack of function. Before a scientist can do any research on biological function, they must decide and describe the function that they will research. And I can't remember why I put this picture in here. This is the Old West. Uh, O'Donnell, O'Donnell's Saloon. Uh, hotel and cafe. Can't remember why I put this picture in there. I think it had to do with prostitution. But uh, of course, all these are guys except this lady right here in front. She probably is O'Donnell. There's another lady back there. Everybody else is male. Uh, by comparing species, scientists can speculate how behavior and neural structures have changed as species have evolved. But of course, this is assuming that you believe in evolution, that, uh, that uh, uh, most animals, uh, animals evolved from a lower form uh, to a higher form. Uh, humans were, were once more ape-like than they are today. Uh, rats were different, uh, raccoons were different, uh, horses were different. And as an individual grows, they develop the ability to respond to stimuli. As the organism becomes more and more complex and other variables are introduced, behavior and response will change, hopefully. This is known as ontogeny, how an individual changes over a lifetime. Ontogeny. The history of a species tells us the evolutionary de determinants of its behavior. The history of an, an individual tells us the developmental determinants. The scientist must regard the organism as a machine made up of billions of neurons. The reason I have this picture in here is because when you first look at this picture, what do you look at first? And the answer is uh, they map this by uh, using a, a later laser uh, uh, detector uh, in the eye. And what they determined is that, that uh, the two areas that people look at the most are the eyes and the ears, the part in the middle. And then they kind of look around the face to, to determine it's the, the uh, face of Nefertiti, of course. A major goal of biological psychology is to use research findings to improve the health and well-being of humans and other animals. Numerous human diseases involve malfunctioning of the brain, and this is a case of, this is, and then this is an individual with Down syndrome. It's actually four different individuals uh, suffering from Down syndrome. 
Down syndrome is uh, a uh, an extra chromosome on the on the twenty uh, first uh, pair of chromosomes, and uh, and it causes uh, different problems with different people. Uh, it can cause uh, physical problems. It can it's it tends to cause intellectual deficit, uh, but people can live into their into relatively old age. There are three ways to look at brain behavior relations. Uh, somatic intervention, changes in the body changes behavior. Behavioral intervention, psychological changes occur, and this changes body structure or function. Correlation, how can changes in somatic variable affect behavioral uh, variables? Uh, somatic interventions, changes in the body changes behavior. Uh, you get a little bit heavier. Uh, so you decide to exercise. Now you're exercising every day. The change of your body, the gaining of weight, has changed your behavior. Now you're exercising every day. Behavioral interventions, uh, psychological changes occur, and this changes body structure or function. You become depressed. Uh, you become more sedentary. Because you become sedentary, you gain weight, and you have changed your function. You become sedentary and you uh, have changed your function. Uh, if we increase testosterone in a male, will it increase his sexual response? Can we cause the same effect by electrically stimulating his brain? If we cut his vagus nerve, will he lack sexual response? And the answer to all of these questions is yes. If we increase the testosterone in a male, will it increase his sexual response? Yes, it will increase his sexual response. Uh, can we cause the same effect by electrically stimulating his brain? Yes, if we could put an, get an electrode into that area of his brain, yes, we could stimulate, uh, we could make him uh, more sexually responsive. Uh, if we cut his vagus nerve, will he lack sexual response? And the answer is yes. If we cut his vagus nerve, his sexual response will go away. If we put two adults of opposite sex together, will it lead to an increased secretion of certain hormones? And the answer is Yes, it, uh, it really doesn't matter, and it can be a totally platonic situation. Uh, but the hormones of, of each individual will change. If it's a male and a female, if it's two males that are attracted to males, then yes, their hormones will change. It will increase their hormones, uh, all of these things, uh, yes. When people are around other people, their hormones change. When males are around other males and they don't find males sexually attractive, then no, that doesn't happen. If females are around females and they, uh, uh, actually, their hor hormones will, uh, will normalize um, so that they will start having uh, periods at the same time. Can we change blood flow to the brain with select visual stimuli? And, of course, that is obviously true. Uh, if people are attracted to somebody, if they see somebody that uh, that uh, uh, that they find attractive, uh, it will increase the blood flow to the brain. Uh, they will concentrate on that select individual, uh, and it will increase the blood flow to the brain. If we change the circumstances of the, of the interaction to include dangerous stimulation, will it cause a change in the response of the individuals? And this is an experiment that they did on a on a uh, Bouncing uh, long, bouncing bridge over a uh, over a crevasse. Uh, so it was fairly dangerous, and they had a an attractive woman uh, that was talking to uh, to males on this bridge. And uh, one of the things they noticed was that they thought the males thought that the woman was attracted to them uh, because there were a lot of things going on. The adrenaline, the extra adrenaline, is actually what made them more think that they were uh, that she was uh, sexually attracted to them. Looking at people with frequent sexual response, will we find higher levels of hormones? And the answer is yes. Uh, can we correlate high levels of hormones with frequent sexual response? And the answer is yes. The human brain and its peripheral neuronal structures can change with stimulation from the environment. This is known as neuroplasticity. Parts of neurons called dendritic spines seem to be in constant motion and can change shape in a matter of seconds. In a very real way, other individuals can affect a change on the structure of an individual's brain. Stimulation will induce neuronal growth. Lack of stimulation will retard neuronal growth. 
And this is how we learn things. We learn things because of these dendritic spines. We're, we're creating pathways in our brain. And this is how we remember things. Uh, so you may have never heard the, the term neuroplasticity before, uh, but now that uh, I have introduced it to you, there is a dendritic spine being formed in your brain. So the next time you, you, you hear the word plasticity, uh, you're going to think two things. You're going to think, well, plastic, you know, something that's plastic. Uh, and you're also going to think, wait a minute, that has to do with the structure of my brain. Uh, the fact that uh, I am constantly forming new ideas. Plasticity, yeah, Bradway said that. He may be the goofiest guy in the world. Uh, now you're going to remember Bradway and Goofy, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, he's the one that taught me about plasticity. And plasticity has to do with, with these dendritic spines and neur neurons connecting with one another, creating pathways. Yes, there we go. Plasticity means creating pathways, cell assemblies. Researchers have been able to induce the uh, brains of human subjects to be more active by suggesting to select individuals that water that they would be dipping their hands in would be hot. And this was the experiment. They told them that, the, be careful, the water's hot. So when they put their hand in it, no matter how hot it was, they thought it was hotter. They thought it was hot, even though it may have been lukewarm, it may have been cold. And uh, they responded as if the water was hot. Suggestions. Subjects uh, who did not experience the suggestion had less active brain activity and, and reported less discomfort from the water. And let's see if this works. The answer is yes. I think we have an advertisement. Oh, no, here we go. Being human, we each view ourselves as a unique and independent individual. But we're never alone. Millions of microscopic beings inhabit our bodies, and no two bodies are the same. Each is a different habitat for microbial communities, from the arid deserts of our skin to the villages on our lips and the cities in our mouths. Even every tooth is its own distinctive neighborhood. And our guts are teeming metropolises of interacting microbes. And in these bustling streets of our guts, we see a constant influx of food, and every microbe has a job to do. Here's a cellulitic bacteria, for example. Their one job is to break down cellulose, a common compound in vegetables, into sugars. Those simple sugars then move along to the respirators, another set of microbes that snatch up these simple sugars and burn them as fuel. As food travels through our digestive tract, it reaches the fermenters who extract energy from these sugars by converting them into chemicals like alcohol and hydrogen gas, which they spew out as waste products. Deeper in the depths of our gut city, the syntrophs eke out a living off the fermenters' trash. At each step of this process, energy is released, and that energy is absorbed by the cells of the digestive tract. This city we just saw is different in everyone. Every person has a unique and diverse community of gut microbes that can process food in different ways. One person's gut microbes may be capable of releasing only a fraction of the calories that another person's gut microbes can extract. So what determines the membership of our gut microbial community? Well, things like our genetic makeup and the microbes we encounter throughout our lives can contribute to our microbial ecosystems. The food we eat also influences which microbes live in our gut. For example, food made of complex molecules like an apple requires a lot of different microbial workers to break it down. But if a food is made of simple molecules like a lollipop, some of these workers are put out of a job. Those workers leave the city never to return. What doesn't function well are gut microbial communities with only a few different types of workers. For example, humans who suffer from diseases like diabetes or chronic gut inflammation typically have less microbial variety in their guts. 
We don't fully understand the best way to manage our individual microbial societies, but it is likely that lifestyle changes, such as eating a varied diet of complex plant-based foods, can help revitalize our microbial ecosystems in our gut and across the entire landscape of our body. So we are really not alone in our body. Our bodies are homes to millions of different microbes, and we need them just as much as they need us. As we learn more about how our microbes interact with each other and with our bodies, we will reveal how we can nurture this complex invisible world that shapes our personal identity, our health, and our well-being. Okay. Uh, interesting. Okay, so think of it this way. Um, um, we all have different genetic structures. Uh, my uh, ancestors came from Europe. Of course, we've been in the United States. We've been in the Americas for about 400 years. My, my family has it. Anyway. Uh, other individuals, um, they, they, their family have, have only been here. They have immigrated to the United States 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Mine's been here for a long time. Uh, of course, you guys have been here for thousands of years. So we're talking about different genetic structures. So my genetics are one thing, your genetics are totally different. Uh, most, of, most of Western food is, this has, is very similar to what it has been for the last, you know, two or 3,000 years. Um, and one thing that happened when, uh, when the Europeans first arrived, uh, they found that the diet that was being eaten uh, in the Americas, a lot of corn, uh, a lot of meat, uh, was different from, from theirs, and they really couldn't, didn't do a very good job of tolerating that. Uh, so when uh, the indigenous peoples in the Americas started eating Western food, they also had a difficult time. It had a lot more sugar, it had a lot more starch in it than anything that they had been eating before. They'd been eating a lot of lean meat, and, and uh, um, uh, Europeans didn't have as much meat over in Europe. Uh, so they were eating fatty meat. Uh, beef, for example, is fairly fatty. Uh, uh, pork uh, from some pigs is fairly fatty. And pork used to be a lot fattier than it is today. I, I can remember opening up a, a, a bacon package when I was when I was a single parent, and there would be hardly any red in it at all. Uh, you could cook up bacon, and it would just almost all shrink away. Uh, and it created a lot of bacon grease, but uh, didn't create a whole lot of meat. Uh, so even to this day, I don't think of of bacon as meat. I think of it as uh, as Half fat, half half meat, half meat. Uh, anyway, um, this is one of the reasons why uh, diabetes potentially uh, developed in uh, in the indigenous populations here. One is has to do with genetic structure. The other has to do with uh, the microbiomes, the uh, the bacteria that are in your gut. Uh, we have more bacteria in in and on our bodies than we have cells in our bodies. There are more bacteria, so we are our bacteria. Um, and of course, your genetic structure allows you to have uh, select bacteria. My genetic structure allows me to have a s select genetic structure. I can consume sugars and, and not uh, develop diabetes. Um, I, can I can eat starches and not develop diabetes. And if I were indigenous, uh, probably that wouldn't be the case. I, I would need to stay away from uh, starches and sugars because that would create, uh, it's, uh, my body uh, would store it as fat and that fat would, would create a diabetic situation. Anyway, that's the way it is. That's the way the world works. Uh, if you go to China, uh, where they eat a lot of uh, rice and not not a lot of meat, but they eat a lot of rice or uh, wheat products. Um, they have a totally different genetic structure. They have a totally di different uh, genetic uh, biome. So um, if you're married to somebody from Asia, uh, somebody who's Chinese, Japanese, or, or Korean, 
uh, potentially um, they have a different uh, diet uh, than you do. They uh, thrive on a different diet uh, than potentially you do. It's just the way it works. Oops. Many times psychological uh, research follows a plan of reductionism. The researchers begin with a general behavioral reaction and then follow it from the behavior to the central nervous system. Looking at the response in the brain, they locate the area of the brain affected. From the affected area, they isolate the single nerves that are affected. Uh, they then will look at the chemical changes that take place in the neuron. Using the technique of reductionism, researchers can break down the complex mechanism that leads to brain malfunctions. About 90% of all Americans suffer from some form of psychiatric disorder. Another 3.2% suffer from some neurological disorder. Alzheimer's disease is the fastest growing affliction in the industrialized societies. Alzheimer's disease. Why is that? Well, are we going to get the answer? Uh, I don't think we are. Uh, why is that? Because people are living longer. And uh, as it turns out, dementia is, is a common uh, uh, factor in, uh, in aging. And uh, since we are living longer, uh, we are detecting more people with Alzheimer's disease. We've also uh, uh, changed the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. It's more inclusive than it used to be. But as you can see, the most prevalent neurological disorder is, and I don't have my, wait a second, uh, I don't have my arrow. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is, is the most prevalent neurological disorder. Second is epilepsy, and third is stroke. Um, most severe uh, incident of psychiatric disorder is severe anxiety. Uh, alcoholism is second. Alcohol and drug abuse is second. And severe depression is third. So there you go. Much of the research dealing with psychology is done on other species by comparing the reactions of other species. Researchers are able to judge how humans will react in similar situations. 93% of animals used in research are some form of rodents, either mice or rats. And this is a joke. Uh, causes of death in lab rats. 22% uh, cancer research. 17.5% neuro neurological research. 36% genetic disease research. That's not the joke. The joke is the PETA rescue gone bad. That's, that's the joke. One on top. Killed during escape attempt, 1.4%. Uh, and that's the end of that chapter. Let's go into chapter two. I know I was going to do chapter two next week. This is a short chapter, but let's go ahead and, and talk about <coughs> chapter two. Uh, the nervous system. The nervous system is composed of cells called nerve cells, or neurons. The average human body has about 100 billion and 100 billion neurons. 100, between 100 million, a billion and 150 billion neurons, sorry. Neurons communicate with each other at a point known as a synapse. Another cell that protects and adds structure to the nervous system is the glial cell. The neuron is composed of four major parts. The dendrites uh, collect the, in, the stimuli or information and transmits it to the rest of the neuron. The soma or the cell body contains the nucleus and serves to maintain the cell. The axon is the main transmitting apparatus. The axon terminals are where the neuron passes on the information to another cell. So they, correct, they collect the information in the dendrites, it runs through the cell body, or the soma, uh, and then it runs through the axon and it ends up at the axon terminals where the information is relayed to, to, another, to another entity. Now, one of the interesting things is this word right here, soma. Soma always means body. Um, somatic is of the body. <clears throat> so anytime, it's, it's Latin. So anytime you see this word soma, it has to do with the total mass, the soma, the body. Neurons can be classified in three basic ways, either by shape, size, or function. Uh, multipolar neurons have many dendrites and a single axon. 
Most of the neurons of the vertebrate uh, brain are multipolar. There you go. This is this is it. That's a mess. Bipolar neurons have a single dendrite and at one end uh, at one end and a single axon at the other. Most of the neurons of the sensory system are bipolar, especially those of the retina and the olfactory system, smelling and seeing. Monopolar uh, neurons have a single branch coming off the soma that branches in two different directions. One branch will be the input direction and the other will be the output direction, but there are axons going in both directions. Some neurons are very large and some are very small. Examples of small cells would be granule, uh, spindle, and stellate neurons. Examples of large neurons would be pyramidal, Golgi, and Purkinje neurons. There's a reason why these are capitalized. These are people that discovered them, Golgi and Purkinje. Functionally, neurons either receive stimuli, create a response, or connect the two. Sensory neurons collect the stimulus and pass the message on to the vast network of connector neurons or interneurons. Motor neurons connect to muscles or glands and create the response by making the muscles contract or by changing the activity of the gland. Motor neurons. Neurons do not touch each other but communicate between the dendrite of one neuron and the axon of another across a gap known as the synaptic cleft. And this synaptic cleft becomes extremely important because this is how we treat um, uh, psychological problems. We try to increase uh, the neurotransmitters or decrease the, the neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. At the end of the axon is the axon terminal. The axons end uh, in expanded areas called buttons or boutons. Uh, buttons is, boutons is French for buttons. And these are the buttons right here the synaptic vesicles. The end of the axon is known as a presynaptic zone. That's the part that's give, it's giving off uh, whatever the, the uh, neurotransmitter is, the chemical that will be the communicant. The area of the receiving dendrite is known as the postsynaptic zone. It will receive the information. It will receive the chemical. The message is, is actually transported by a chemical known as a neurotransmitter that is contained in spheres in the axon called synaptic vesicles. And here are the synaptic vesicles. They will release their chemical. It will cross, across, it will cross the synaptic cleft, and it will be received by the postsynaptic zone. One of the interesting areas of study dealing with neurons are projections coming from the dendrites called spines. These spines seem to change with experience and have been known to change within seconds when an individual is exposed to a novel stimuli. If you are learning something new, then these spines will become activated and they will create a new pathway. And this is memory. This is how you remember things. The movement of the dendritic spines. And there you go, dendritic spines creating new pathways through the, through the brain. I'm 72 years old, so you can imagine how many pathways I've got through my brain. Not only that, but I've been educated in four different areas. I don't speak a foreign language, but uh, I know a lot of foreign words, as weird as that is. Anyway, my whole point is that uh, the more novel experiences you have, the more new things that happen to you, uh, the more complex your brain is going to be. Now the interesting thing is uh, that you can, you can train your brain to learn a lot of new things. And the way you do that is by experiencing novel things throughout your lives. Uh, this means babies, uh, seeing new things, uh, seeing flashing lights, playing with toys, uh, getting a new toy. All of these things are really good for, for people because uh, it, uh, it uh, creates this, um, all these new pathways. It creates a situation where new pathways are normally being made, and that's good. That's good for everybody. Then, then when they get into school, they will be curious, 
and their curiosity will lead to new information, and all that new information will lead to new pathways, and there you go. Can you fill your brain up? And the answer is no. Uh, your brain will continue to grow throughout your life, even just before you die. The axon projects from the soma in an expanded area known as the axon hillock. And this is the axon hillock right there. The electrical impulse begins in the widened hillock and intensifies as it moves into the narrower axon proper. Almost all neurons have only one axon. However, some have axons that divide and form several branches. This branching is known as axon collaterals. When someone smashes their finger, the stimuli uh, must follow a nerve pathway to tell the brain what has happened. Uh, nerves that take stimuli from its point of origin to the central nervous system are called afferent neurons. Afferent with A. Now the confusing thing is, uh, as the, uh, the message is sent back to the uh, affected area, uh, as the, uh, the message goes back the other direction, this is called an efferent. These are efferent neurons, afferent and efferent. And of course, they're probably both pronounced exactly the same. But I like to, to make sure that people know that uh, it, and it's in alphabetical order. Uh, so when you get, when you smash your finger, uh, the information is, is taken to the, the central nervous system by afferent neurons. And uh, when it sends back a message, move your hand, stupid. Uh, because uh, you're going to smash it again if you don't, uh, then that's an efferent. That's the efferent neurons are telling you to move your finger. The soma manufactures proteins that maintain growth and function in the neuron. This protein is able to make its way down into the distant areas of the axon and dendrites by a process known as axonal transport. The protein is moved along tiny hollow cylinders known as microtubules. This becomes very important when we start talking about pharmaceuticals because some of the pharmaceuticals uh, affect the microtubules. It moves the medication through these microtubules. It changes the function of the microtubules. What are we talking about? We're talking about high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, then we need to slow things down. And one of the ways to slow things down in your 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 body is by changing the uh, the rapidity that these microtubules are transporting fluids and if we can slow it down then we can lower your blood pressure and that's usually what happens so what uh, what are what microtubules are we slowing down uh, well in the case of beta blockers what we are doing is slowing down the microtubules uh, in the heart muscle so that the heart doesn't beat as strong. So even if you're excited, your, your heart's not beating nearly as strong. For some reason, you've conditioned your body to uh, create a uh, hypertensive situation uh, when you get stressed or uh, excited. So what we have to do is we have to give you a uh, blood pressure medication that slows the whole process down. And there you go. That's why I am still alive, because I take blood pressure medication. Protein uh, molecules travel down smaller rods inside the microtubules called neurofilaments and even tinier microfilaments. And sometimes these are the uh, medications that are affected. These are the structures that are affected by the medications. Glial cells are part of the neuronal system in that they provide structure to the neuronal groupings and help hold them in place. And they help maintain the neurons by feeding them. There are four types of glial cells, and these become important because the glial cells protect the neurons. Okay, so what's going on? Well, we're, we decided we we're going to play uh, football, and then we have to go to soccer practice. Well, in football, we're slamming our foreheads against other guys' helmets. Uh, it's almost like uh, wrecking your car, but we're doing it with our heads. Uh, so there potentially is damage being done. Uh, to our neurons. Now, if we do this too much, we're going to have a lot of damage, and that's uh, CTA, I think, is that what it, they call it? Uh, uh, the cerebral trauma, um, CTE, I guess, CTE. Uh, that's what's happening with some football players, um, and they're committing suicide. 
uh, they're becoming overly aggressive um, because of the damage done to their neurons in their brain. Uh, but the job of the glial cell is to protect those neurons. Um, so, you know, you go to football practice, now it's soccer practice afterwards, and you decide you're going to head that, that soccer ball. I don't know if you've ever uh, headed a, a soccer ball that's coming in from a long distance, but it's like trying to head a shot put. It feels like that anyway. Uh, so, you know, you, you're doing damage. The more you head the ball, uh, the, the more you hit your head on anything, whether it's a soccer ball or, or whether you get hit in the head by a, a pitched baseball, uh, you're doing damage to yourself or you bang your head against another guy's helmet. So it's the job of the glial cells to protect you and it's the job of the glial cells to protect all of your neurons. So there's four different types of glial cells, the astrocytes, the microglial cells, the oligodendrocytes, and the Schwann cells. And these are all glial cells in different areas of your, centri of your nervous system. Astrocytes are star-shaped. Astro means uh, star. So these are astro cells. Star-shaped glial cells that protect neuronal bundles, especially in the brain. So it's the astrocyte's job to keep you from damaging too many of your neurons in your brain. The dura mater, which is a tough sheet that is wrapped around the brain for protection, is composed of astrocytes. Now, I have been in on brain surgeries before, and I have watched them cut through the astrocytes, the, this uh, dura mater. Uh, it's pliable, and uh, it's not easy to get through. It's like trying to cut through thick... Uh, 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 bisqueen or you know thick plastic and that's the way it is it's really kind of interesting watching uh, surgeons try to cut through this stuff I, I mean it, they do it of course it's a very sharp blade they like to do it with uh, lasers now uh, which uh, opens it up fairly fairly readily uh, but when they were using a, uh, a scalpel sometimes they'd have to cut twice before they could get through the uh, dura matter. Astrocytes contribute to the metabolism of neurons and provide uh, restorative protein to them. Microglial cells are very small, hence the name micro. Uh, they migrate to areas of injury or disease and remove debris from injured or de dead neurons. This is really important because we are banging our heads all the time. And this is one of the reasons why you should never listen to that music, that headbanger music, because if you're banging your head, even if you are shaking your head violently from side to side, your brain is shifting in your head. That's why they call them headbangers. Well, it's the job of the microglial cell to clear, clear out all the debris that's created from the destroyed neurons. The more neurons you destroy, the more the microglial cells have to work. Uh, as you get older, the microglial cells don't work as well. And this is one of the reasons why people develop Alzheimer's disease. The microglial cells are not cleaning out the debris anymore. There's too much destruction and uh, they can't get rid of it. So the less you bang your head against a cement wall, the, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the less uh, shot puts you try to head in soccer, the, the better off you're going to be. The less football that you play. Uh, where you are trying to tackle people with your forehead. Uh, and, of course, that's known as spearing now. Uh, so the better off you're going to be. Just try to keep your head from anything happening to it. Uh, myelin sheets that surround and protect the neurons are created by glial cells. Uh, these myelin sheets do uh, not only protect the neuron, but accelerate the response of the neuron as well. Oligodendrocytes provide the myelin in the brain and the spinal cord. Oligodendrocyte means little tree cell. Uh, so it's like a little tree growing around the neuron and protecting it. Schwann cells construct the myelin outside the brain and spinal column. Schwann cells are small and each one will wrap itself around the axon to protect it and accelerate response. So our legs, our arms, these uh, are all being protected. All the neurons are being protected by Schwann cells. In the spinal column and in our brains, uh, we have the, uh, the uh, astrocytes, which are protecting the uh, brain in general. 
and we have the oligodendrocytes, which are protecting each neuron inside the brain, or some of the neurons in the brain. As we're going to find out, there are two different er there are two basic areas of the brain. You have gray matter and white matter. The white matter are actually covered by oligodendrocytes, and the gray matter is doesn't have any myelin at all. They are slower acting because myelin in, uh, accelerates the response uh, of the neuron. Okay, so we've got oligodendrocytes protecting our um, uh, central nervous system. We have the astrocytes, which are the general protectors, the, the mass protectors of the uh, central nervous system, especially the brain and the spinal column. Uh, we have the Schwann cells, which protect all the neurons outside of the uh, central nervous system. And we have the microcytes, which are the housekeepers. They are the ones that uh, clear out all the debris that needs to be cleared out. And as you get older, here I am, 72 years old, as we get older, we, need, we have more and more of our neurons that are breaking down uh, because we're aging and they're not being replaced, of course. And we need those micro, uh, uh, microglial sites to, uh, to take care of things. Is that right? Yeah, microglial cells. Uh, to clear out all that debris, oh, I couldn't remember microglial. Well, actually, I did remember microglial, but I put the sites on the end. When you look at uh, a myelin formed around an axon, you will see that the Schwann cells don't touch each other, but leave a gap between each cell. These are known as nodes of Ranvier, and information will, will jump over from one uh, microglial cell to the other. Actually, it's staying inside, but the... Uh, the uh, myelin is, is accelerating the process uh, because there is no interference and they, it will jump over these gaps, these nodes of Ranvier. When an individual suffers a blow to the head, the injury tends to heal slower than a blow to any other part of the body. This is because besides causing localized damage, the glial cells become larger by taking on moisture. This is known as edema. Anytime uh, you, you uh, have swelling uh, in your body, uh, it's because your body is trying to protect itself by swelling up, and this is known as edema. Uh, the swelling up is usually serial fluid. It's not really water. It's not salt water. It is serial fluid, and it is trying to protect that area of the body. Uh, so if, uh, I, uh, if I get hit with a uh, pitch in the head, it causes a lump that's probably blood, but inside it, it causes uh, uh, con a concussion, and the concussion is this edema that is being created. And of course, I'm, it's going to put pressure on my brain, and it's going to make my brain malfunction to an extent. And this is one of the reasons why we all we uh, uh, try to figure out if somebody has a concussion before we let them continue to do what they were doing to create the concussion. Baseball players, uh, uh, if they get hit in the head, and uh, the Giants just had a guy that was hit in the head. Oh, it was Tyro Estrada got hit in the head by a, with a pitch. And uh, he was out for 10 days uh, because there were, they have concussion protocols. And uh, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have his memory back. Um, he may have felt dizzy. Uh, he, his eyesight might, may have been a little off. And it's caused by the edema, the edema, the swelling. Uh, localized swelling. The nervous system of the human body can be subdivided into two nervous systems. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system uh, includes all the other neurons outside the brain and the spinal cord, and there are the two. Peripheral nervous system on the left, anything but the spinal cord and the brain, and that is the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nerves are categorized by what part of the central nervous system they are connected to. Cranial nerves are connected directly to the brain. Spinal nerves are connected directly to the spinal column. Autonomic nerves in the autonomic nervous system are connected to glands and organs and trigger automatic responses from these areas. There are 12 cranial nerves that control sensory or muscular movements in the head or neck region. 
Four of the nerves control the muscles of the eye and the eyesight uh, sensations. Four control the muscles of the neck, face, and tongue, and the sensations of tongue, uh, sinuses, and throat. Uh, and one controls the sensations of the inner ear, and the vagus nerve controls the heart, the lungs, and digestion. Justin Bieber just had uh, paralysis on one side of his uh, on one side of his face, and it was these four uh, neur neuronal structures that was his problem. Uh, it uh, affected his neck, his face, his tongue, and uh, his sinuses and his throat, and because of that, he couldn't sing. I think he's better now. I don't think he's back on tour, uh, but uh, it, his his problem was genetic. Uh, his problem didn't have anything theoretically. Uh, his problem was genetic. Uh, part, you know, there's there's a lot of different things. Bell's palsy. I think we're going to talk about Bell's palsy in a minute. There, there are a lot of things that can cause this problem. Usually, uh, this type of paralysis is caused by a virus. In his case, it was a genetic structure. So, will this happen again? Um, yeah. Well, one of the. <laughs> Let me give you a hint and a warning. A lot of times, what happens is uh, you have a genetic proclivity for something uh, and then you do something stupid like snort cocaine or shoot up with heroin or take crystal meth and uh, since you have that proclivity then something happens. Um, let's say you have a heart anomaly that nobody's discovered yet and then you snort cocaine. Cocaine is of course a vasoconstrictor. It constricts the blood vessels in your heart. Your heart uh, normally, since you you never constrict the blood vessels in your heart like that, uh, this anomaly, this this uh, problem that you potentially have, if your your heart muscles are ever constricted, <clears throat> uh, that never happens until you snort the cocaine. Then all of a sudden, you, the anomaly shows itself up, and you die. Uh, same kind of thing can happen in the brain. Um, Parkinson's disease, there's a genetic structure that creates Parkinson's disease, uh, but you can create Parkinson-like symptoms from, from uh, snorting too much cocaine. And if you have a genetic proclivity for Parkinson's disease uh, and you snort cocaine, uh, then potentially what you're going to do is kick yourself into Parkinson's disease at a very young age. And that is what happened to Michael J. Fox. Uh, he started developing symptoms of Parkinson's disease in his 30s, uh, late 20s and early 30s. So uh, he kind of did it. He, he would have been better off if he'd, if he'd been a little smarter. But, I mean, these are, these are things that happen. I, most of us don't, never come in contact with that kind of stuff. So we never have to worry about it and then you know it's people like uh, uh, people become celebrities and they start snorting cocaine or shooting up with heroin and all of a sudden they have these really strange problems that uh, that we hardly ever see you know we hardly ever see it because most people don't have this genetic structure plus the cocaine or the heroin or, or the crystal meth or whatever I guess I'm preaching again, aren't I? <laughs> Sorry. There are 31 spinal nerves, uh, pairs of spinal nerves, one pair on each side of your body. Uh, there are five segments of spinal cord column. I'm What I'm thinking is uh, D Justin Bieber probably wouldn't have had that problem if he hadn't. Uh, who knows what he's been doing? You know, He's uh, one of the most famous singers in the world. He's tattooed all over the place. Uh, the if if you think he he has never tried cocaine, you're probably being naive, or I'm just being cynical. You can you can take that if you like. Uh, but anytime one of these things happens to a rocker, I always assume you idiot. What are you doing? You know, um, one of my favorite blues guitarists was a guy by the name of uh, Gary Moore. He was uh, he was uh, uh, from Northern Ireland. Um, and he was a blues guitarist, and he he put an album, he put a bunch of albums out, but uh, one of them, uh, uh, I still have blues for you, 
Um, one of the, you know, it was, it's, it's about six minutes long, and it's just a really good song. Anyway, <clears throat> he was a drinker, uh, and he drank himself to death uh, at, in, in his 40s. You know, well, if he'd stayed away from alcohol, he'd still be alive, but, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, I, I'll stop being cynical. Uh, there are five segments of the spinal column, uh, cord and column. Uh, there are eight cervical nerves. This is in your neck. Um, there are 12 thoracic nerves. Uh, this is in your torso. Um, they control your, pretty much, they, con they, they control your rib cage, and they also control your lungs. Um, thoracic means brace. Cervical means collar. Um, and, of course, you can have all kinds of interesting problems with your neck. There are five lumbar nerves, and they're fairly, it's a fairly simple, and they're fairly spread out. Uh, lumbar means belt. I think it's in Greek. Greek. There are five sacral nerves. Uh, this is uh, around your pelvis and your hip, around your hip area. Uh, sacral means girdle. And then there are one, there's one coccygeal nerve. And if you've ever fallen on your tailbone, you know. You know where it is. <laughs> Anyways, coccygeal means tailbone in Greek. So there you go. <clears throat> and there they all are. The thoracic nerves that control your rib cage and your lungs. This is your lumbar region. Uh, this is the part that isn't supported by anything. Your pelvis supports your, your sacral region. Your, uh, your rib cage supports your thoracic region. This is the open area. This is the open area that uh, is really dangerous, these lumbar nerves uh, that have to be protected. There are five of them. But there's nothing protecting them. Your rib cage is always protecting uh, your thoracic nerves and your lungs, of course, very important. Uh, the cervical nerves are, are, don't have anything protecting them either. So the two most vulnerable parts of your uh, spinal column are your cervical is your cervical area and your lumbar area, and usually if something happens, uh, it happens right there, right in especially your lower back, or you can have neck problems. Doggone it! Um, one of the things that we're seeing, and and the, this the curvature of your cervical nerves is a little bit more than this. This is kind of straight. If you have a whiplash, this is what it looks like. <laughs> If you take an x-ray from this side, this is what it looks like. Normally, it's a lot more curved than that. But one of the things that we're seeing with uh, people that uh, are on their cell phones all the time, bent over looking at their cell phones, your head's heavy. I mean, it's really heavy, and your neck's not very strong uh, unless you do neck exercises. So one of the things we're seeing is a hunchback. It's, it's creating a hunchback where the uh, cervical nerves are straightening out. Uh, and because of that, uh, it, it creates a, a natural hump right here, uh, and it's it's uh, causing a, a hunchback in, in some kids. So what they're doing, they're having to put braces on them and making them stay away from their cell phones. Uh, it's called text neck, uh, and it looks like a whiplash, as weird as that is. So if you see your kids, all you know, they're bent over all the time, and they start looking like they've got a hump. A hunchback, one of the things you need to do is get them off their damn cell phones. Um, because otherwise, you can take them to the doctor. I don't know if they're, they're only putting braces on people who are fairly extreme. But, uh, yeah, this is a possibility. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? Uh, you know, I, I just heard my cell phone ding in another room. I don't really care. <laughs> but I'm an old man. What do I know? The autonomic or automatic nervous system is divided into two nervous systems. Somat uh, the sympathetic nervous system prepares the body for action by shutting down normal functions, increasing power stores, and increasing sensory activity. The parasympathetic nervous system returns the body to a normal state after the sympathetic reaction. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system reaction, when the need for action is detected, uh, the sympathetic nervous system will dilate the pupils, improving your eyesight. It will inhibit salivation, salivation causing dry mouth, not sal salvation. <laughs> it will relax airways, allowing deeper breathing. 
It accelerates your heart. It stimulates sweat glands. Uh, so you get what they call flop sweat. It stimulates your liver to, liver to release, release energy stores. It slows your digestion. It inhibits your kidney function. It constricts your blood vessels in your skin. Now, uh, this has happened to me, my sympathetic nervous system. Uh, let me tell you the story. This is how, this is how um, I missed a, a, a track meet when I was in college. When I was in college, I got married when I was a sophomore. And my wife uh, would uh, try to manipulate me by threatening to go home to mama. Uh, and, you know, so one weekend we were, she was going to go home to, to mama. And she was going to take the baby. And, you know, ah, 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 ah. this is my senior year. Uh, I was uh, uh, teaching, student teaching. I was a student teacher. I wanted to be a high school teacher. And I was a high school teacher for a year or so, uh, but uh, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, so I had to student teach on Monday, and then we had a track meet that night. Uh, so all weekend, she's telling me she's going to leave. And Sunday, we she, we packed the car, and I started to take her home. And halfway halfway there, she decides she doesn't want to do it. She wants to come, come back, so we go back. Um, so we argued, literally, we argued all weekend ugly ugly weekend so monday comes up and i and i student teach uh that morning which is really stressful i don't know uh if you can think about that uh so i student taught in the morning and then in the in, at four o'clock we had a track meet and so i in i ran uh, i ran four races i ran the uh 440 re yard relay uh, which is only 110 yards i ran the 220 yard dash uh, I ran the 440 yard dash and then I ran the mile relay. Uh, but I started throwing up after the uh, after the 400 meter relay, which are four, 440 yard relay. It's 400 meter relay now. Uh, but I started throwing up and I, I ran the 220. Uh, it was the next race, I think. No, the next race was a 400. I came in second. I didn't win. You know, I normally won. Uh, and I threw up afterwards. And then. Uh, it was time for me to run the 220. Went ahead and ran it. Came in third. I usually won it, and here I was. Then I just was throwing up like crazy. Uh, so when it came time to to run the uh, mile relay, I couldn't do it. I was I was dehydrated. I was vomiting. Ah, uh, so they took me to the hospital and they said uh, your kidneys aren't working. And uh, you know they did blood tests and whatnot. And they kept me in the hospital for a week to make sure my kidneys had kicked back in. What had happened, I'd been on, my sympathetic nervous system had uh, uh, had taken over uh, all weekend because I was arguing with that crazy lady that, uh, who was my wife at the time but isn't anymore. <laughs> and that's what happened. So uh, because of all the stress of, of uh, the argument and, and, and everything, uh, and and the uh, student teaching and the track meet, we uh, I, I couldn't run. I had a difficult time, and I had uh, I was out for almost the whole season because of my kidneys. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, of course, everything goes back to normal. It constricts your pupils, stimulates your salvation, salivation, not your salvation. <laughs> it constricts your airways. It slows your heartbeat. It stimulates digestion. It dilates uh, blood vessels in the intestines. It dilates blood vessels in the skin. Uh, it flushes your skin. And of course, this is what people notice, the fact that your skin is flushed uh, when, the, when everything kicks off. All the danger is gone. All of a sudden, your face turns red. The uh, average brain weighs uh, about 1,400 grams. It's about three pounds. Uh, that's a lot of weight. You, if you carry a three pound, try carrying a three pound weight in your hand for an extended length of time. That's like your head trying to, you know, your neck trying to carry your muscle, your uh, your head around. Uh, the major part of the brain is the cerebrum, uh, which is divided into two hemispheres. Intellectual capacity seems to be contained in the surface area, uh, surface area of the brain. The surface area of the brain is increased through ridges and folding that triples the surface area of the brain. 
The convolutions, convolutions are called gyri, and the furrows are called sulci, and this is Greek for convolutions and furrows, gyri and sulci. The brain contains four fairly distinct lobes that are four fairly distinct, have four fairly distinct functions. The frontal lobe, this big chunk right here in red, is in the front of the brain and is, is the seat of higher level thought. The parietal lobe is on top of the brain and controls fine body movements. The occipital lobe is in the back and controls sight, and the temporal lobe is on the side and controls hearing. If an individual lost half their brain before they reach puberty, except for some fine motor movements, they would seem perfectly normal. You wouldn't be able to tell that they were only half-brained. Their intelligence would be exactly the same. The two hemispheres of the brain are connected by a mass of thick myelinated neuron, neurons called the corpus callosum. Uh, one of the things we need to say about the corpus callosum is that it's about 11% 11, 11 larger in uh, females than it is in males. So there you go. The, the male brain on average is larger than the female brain, and this doesn't have to do with size. Uh, their brains are just bigger, it has something to do with testosterone, uh, but the corpus callosum is larger in females. And that uh, allows their, the two hemispheres of the brain to communicate more readily with that extra 11% of corpus callosum. If we cross-sectioned an individual's brain, we would see that some of the brain is made up of tightly packed non-myelinated neurons that look gray. They're actually gray. Other areas, uh, that's the surface, is, is all gray. The areas uh, look white. Uh, other areas will look white because of the myelinated neurons that make, make them up. Researchers have found that the larger gray area of the brain, the more intelligent the individual is. This is where thinking takes place, in the gray area. Thinking is a slow process, and that's because it is in the gray area. As a baby begins to develop from ever-expanding a number of cells, the brain and central nervous system begin as a structure known as the neural tube. In the beginning, the smaller, more primitive parts of the brain develop before the intellectual portion of the brain, the cerebral cortex. Uh, and the, part, the cerebral cortex is the spinal cord, the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. The cerebellum uh, surrounds two areas that scientists consider an evolutionary old part of the brain that they sometimes refer to, refer to as the reptilian brain. There are two portions of the reptilian brain, the basal ganglia, the basic nerve sheath, that's what basal ganglia means, and the limbic system, which means the border system. So the limbic system is right in the middle of the reptilian brain. Uh, this, the basal ganglia is, this is the basal ganglia right here. Uh, the basal ganglia includes the caudate nucleus, which caudate uh, means tail. The putamen, which means stone, and it looks like a rock. Where's the putamen? There it is, uh, this purple thing right here. The globus pallidus, which means pale sphere. Uh, the substantia nigra, which means black substance. Uh, the substantia nigra is not here. Uh, where is it? Still not there. The limbic system is made up of the amygdala, which means almond in uh, Latin. Uh, the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse because it looks like a seahorse. Is that right? Yeah, the green thing. The fornix, which means arch. The cingulate gyrus, which means round girdle. And the, olfa the, the olfactory bulb, which is has to do with eyesight. And the mammillary bodies, which are at the end of the... Uh, at the end of the hippocampus. The largest organ in the center of the brain is the thalamus, which means interchamber, inner chamber. The thalamus acts as a connector between the upper and the lower parts of the brain. The real controlling gland in the brain is the hypothalamus, not the thalamus or the pituitary gland. 
The hypothalamus is called the hypothalamus or less, lesser thalamus because it is below the thalamus. In reality, this tiny portion of the brain controls your hunger, controls your thirst, it regulates your temperature, it controls reproductive behavior, it controls the pituitary gland, which controls almost all of the body's hormonal secretions. Two of the most important areas of the midbrain are the tiny bumps known as the superior and inferior colliculi. Colliculi is merely a word that means trough. Uh, the superior colliculi receives visual information. The inferior colliculi receives information about sound. The substantia nigra, the black substance, releases dopamine. Uh, and of course, if, uh, if somebody develops Parkinson's disease, it is because the substantia nigra is not producing enough dopamine. And therefore, you start having the, uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's a tremor in the hands, uh, a problem walking. Uh, it can cause depression because dopamine makes you feel good. You can see where the substantia nigra is. It's right here, uh, just above your your uh, uh, oblongata, medulla oblongata. Here we go. <clears throat> the reticular uh, formation runs from the midbrain into the medulla. Reticular means network. This portion of the brain controls sleep, arousal, uh, temperature regulation, and motor control. It is the reticular formation that arouses a person when their baby cries, the reticular formation and you wake up that quick as soon as that baby starts crying. It's also this portion of the brain that uh, if you go into a coma, it's usually because of swelling around the reticular formation. Uh, and of course, that makes you uh, sleep. Uh, it uh, makes it difficult for you to regulate your temperature. And of course, you can't move, you're paralyzed if the uh, reticular activating system is uh, is affected. The cerebellum is composed of tightly packed and folded neurons. The neurons in the cerebellum form an interesting fan-shaped structure that includes granule cells, Golgi cells, and Purkinje cells. The Purkinje cells are contained in the middle layer of the neurons in the cerebellum. Purkinje cells are large, multipolar neurons shaped like fans with many dendritic spines. These cells run from the surface of the cerebellum to the brain stem. The intricacy, intricacy of the Purkinje cells allows the cerebellum to control both the fine and gross motor functions of the body. The position of the cerebellum between the spinal cord and the thalamic centers that communicate with the motor complex allows it to control motor functions. So this is the area where muscle memory takes place in your cerebellum. Uh, athletes, dancers, people that uh, do fine uh, movements, uh, they have very well-developed cerebellums. The cerebellum leads into the pons, the first portion of the brainstem. The pons, which actually means bridge, is involved in motor control and sensory analysis. Information from uh, the ear first enters the brain in the pons. The bottom of the brainstem is made up of the medulla, or marrow, or which means uh, marrow or middle. The medulla is always in the middle. Uh, the medulla controls both the neck and tongue muscles. The medulla also contributes to the regulation of breathing and your heart rate. And it's also the medulla that is uh, affected with uh, damage to that portion of your brain. Pons. Pons means bridge in French, uh, which is kind of interesting. Dupont. Du, du means two, two bridges. Uh, two bri Dupont uh, is uh, a family that is uh, from the Zweibrücken area. Zweibrücken is uh, two bridges, means two bridges in German. Uh, and I used to live in Zweibrücken, interestingly enough. Uh, so when you went across the, the, uh, the bridge, it was France. And the people over there talked about Dupont, meaning, of course, uh, the Zweibrücken, uh, and of course I lived in Zweibrücken because we didn't have any tr troops in, in France. 
We only had them in Germany. Anyway, not important. DuPont. DuPont means uh, two bridges. Uh, so if you ever take use chemicals made by DuPont, then uh, you know where they came from. The Zweibrücken area. Of course, if you don't know anything about Germany, talking about Zweibrücken means very little. But Zwei means two, and Brücken means bridges, two bridges. The main intellectual functions occur in the cerebral cortex, uh, the external layer, uh, the cerebral cortex. The, the cerebral cortex is the external layer. It's not very thick. Uh, the cerebral cortex, gray matter, is six layers thick and contains between 50 billion and 100 billion neurons. Now, this sounds like a lot, but it's only like a quarter, a half an inch thick. So it's not very much. The functions uh, of the various regions of the cerebral cortex have been mapped and divided into 46 distinctive areas known in toto as Brodmann's areas. The most numerous neuron in the cerebral cortex is the pyramidal cell. Pyramidal cell dendrites reach to the surface of the cortex and also spread out horizontally. This, uh, these neurons seem to be arranged in columns. Now these columns are very important because it allows you to remember things. It allows you to do things. It allows you to move. What happens if these are disrupted? Are we going to find that out? Yeah, we're going to find that out right here. Okay. Uh, many brain regions have distinctive geometric columnar patterns that seem to function as information processing units. Kind of like computers. If you stack all these computers up, one computer will do one thing, and uh, of course it's it's columnar. And then if you've got one right beside it, uh, it does something else. It's columnar as well. You know, you put 50 of these things in a room, and each computer is doing something different. That's the way the brain works. It's columnar. Some columns begin at the surface and extend all the way to the white matter. Human cerebral cortex contains about a million cortical columns. Most cerebral communication runs vertically, but there are some areas of horizontal communication. The cortical columns of the neocortex are arranged in six distinct layers. However, most communication is vertical and select neurons will extend through several layers, uh, some through all six layers. And that's how information is passed from one place to the other. Okay, so you can see how structured this is, how organized this is, how everything points in this direction. When we talk about schizophrenia, one of the things we're going to, to talk about is the fact that their columns are, are um, disarranged. Uh, and that's why if you've, if you've ever talked to somebody who is a disorganized schizophrenic, uh, their, their minds will just jump from one topic to the other. Why? Be, well, you and I can stay on topic because this is what our brains look like. This is what our brains look like. This is what our brains look like. <clears throat> but if we were schizophrenic, all of the, this would all be jumbled up. So when they have a thought, uh, it may connect to something that doesn't have anything to do with that thought. We can stay on topic. They have a problem staying on topic. Besides the bony skull, the brain is protected by three protective sheets called meninges, or which actually means membrane in, uh, in Greek. The outer layer is t a tough envelope of cells called the dura mater, or the hard mother. <clears throat> and that's made of, up, up of astrocytes, as we said before. It's thick. It's not that easy to get through. Uh, the middle layer uh, maintains an open portion known as the arachnoid, through which flows the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. The inner layer is a delicate membrane known as the pia mater, or the gentle mother. So there are two layers that do the protecting. Actually, all three do the protecting. Uh, the arachnoid uh, area, uh, the middle layer uh, is filled with fluid, and that fluid also protects the brain. Um, it, it, can, it provides a, a fluid cushion. Now, on the outside of the dura mater is also fluid, and this is also spi uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so we've got uh, a layer of, of fluid, we've got a layer, a hard layer of uh, uh, astroglial sites, 
uh, we have another layer of fluid, and then we have a smaller, softer layer of uh, PM matter, uh, and that's also astrocytes. Cerebrospinal fluid is very important. This is the stuff that circulates, it protects the brain, it feeds the brain. Um, if it becomes infected, which is rare, it's extremely rare for meningitis to occur, but if it becomes infected, of course, that bacteria can cause swelling. Uh, the swelling, of course, will cause damage to the brain. And that's one of the reasons why meningitis is so dangerous. Uh, you need to get rid of it as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, it's normally, it can be caused by a virus, but it's normally caused, if it's a virus, if it's a virus, viruses rarely cause that much uh, a swelling. But if it's a bacteria, bacteria cause a lot of swelling. Uh, and that is the danger. Um, and I've seen this over and over again. I used to work in a children's hospital in Omaha. And uh, meningitis was really scary uh, it, because it can spread. Uh, if it's a bacteria that invades the brain, uh, then uh, you got to keep it away from, uh, uh, especially little kids, because their brains are a lot smaller. Adults, not so much. And, and it's easier, your immune system is is mature. Uh, of course, babies, their immune system doesn't, uh, is, doesn't become uh, very strong for about six months, and that's why the first six months of life are so dangerous. Um, back before all the antibiotics that we have, uh, mothers used to lose their babies on a relatively, sadly, a relatively frequent basis. Um, as many as a third of babies are, were dying in in infancy because of all these childhood illnesses. Now, of course, we uh, uh, we treat people for these, or we uh, vaccinate them against these illnesses. That's why it's so silly for um, for mothers to refuse uh, to, to, to have their children inoculated. It's just protecting them against these things that can, that can really do damage to them, can kill them, of course whooping cough and meningitis, uh, you know, um, chicken pox, which is a viral disease, but uh, uh, meningitis, you phew, don't play around with this stuff. Polio, another virus, don't play around with this stuff. The brain is not a solid mass. There are four open areas called ventricles. Ventricles one and two are lateral ventricles in each hemisphere. These, uh, this is one and two. The, this one of them's one and one of them's two. I'm not really sure which one is. The, the three ventricle is between the hemispheres below one and two. Uh, this is one and two are these chunks, and this is it right here. And then four ventricle is in front of the uh, cerebellum, and this is this is four. So this is four, this is three, and this is one and two. CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, is produced in the uh, choroid plexus, uh, which means separate braid, a portion of the lining of the ventricles. CSF is basically plasma or blood with the red and white cells removed. Uh, the function of CSF includes it acts as a shock absorber for the brain, as we said. There are two layers around the brain, one on the outside and one in the middle layer of the brain. The brain floats in CSF, so head movements do not disturb the brain. It collects nutrients from blood vessels and passes them on to the brain surface. So CSF is very important. And also, of course, if it becomes infected, now we got a really serious problem that needs to be taken care of instantaneously. We don't want, we, uh, don't want any damage done to the brain. Blood supply is supplied to the brain through two significant arteries, they run on each side of the esophagus. The carotid plunges, uh, carotid means plunge into sleep. Uh, so you can, you can knock somebody out by holding their carotid uh, artery. Uh, the vertebral arteries bracket the spinal cord and enter at the base of the skull. So there's one on each side of the spinal column. There's one on each side of the esophagus. And of course, this supplies blood to the brain. Lots of blood going into the brain. So if you have a blockage of one of these, one of your carotid arteries has a blockage, 
then uh, you can still get enough blood to the brain. You can have uh, blockage in both of your carotid arteries and you still get enough blood to the brain through the vertebral arteries. Uh, this is one of the things that they started doing uh, when they're ch they check old people. They want to make sure that they have good blood flow through their carotid arteries. So they will check your carotid arteries um, uh, to, they'll, with a stethoscope to make sure that there's good blood flow. And there you go. The carotid and the vertebral arteries. At the base of the brain is the... Uh, the carotid and basilar uh, base arteries uh, join to form a structure called the circle of Willis. And this is the circle of Willis right there. The merging of these two cerebral arteries provides a backup in case blood flow is impinged in one of the two major arteries. That's the carotid artery. Despite the rich tissue of the brain and the myriad of viruses and bacteria seeking entry, infections in the organ rarely occur. This is because the capillaries in the brain are much smaller than the capillaries in other parts of the body. Substances in the blood will rarely pass into the brain. This is called the blood-brain barrier. An angiogram, uh, which means vessel picture, is an x-ray of the blood vessels. If a stroke is suspected, an individual can be injected with a dye and the skull can be x-rayed to show possible hemorrhages, aneurysms, uh, or occlusions. And aneurysms means widening of a blood vessel. Uh, occlusion means blood clot or blockage. This is usually the first test performed if a patient is suspected of having a stroke. And now, of course, if it's a blockage of one kind, um, if it's a blockage, and 70% and of all um, uh, strokes are caused by uh, blood clots, uh, then we can give you a medication, TCA, which uh, will dissolve the clot. And if we can get, give you this shot fast enough, then one of the things that will happen is that you will, it will dissolve the blood clot and, and it, it won't, you will have less damage to your brain. How's that? Uh, as exciting as that is. <laughs> once upon a time, and I'm only laughing because <laughs> once upon a time I had a heart attack. <laughs> this is in 2010. I had a heart attack. And they took me to the, uh, they finally got me to the, to the emergency room uh, in a town that was like 30 miles away. Uh, it was funny because we were in an ambulance and the ambulance got stopped for road construction. Here we are, we got flashing lights. And uh, you know, they had to make sure that that, uh, that road grader made its way uh, down the road going at two miles an hour and we couldn't drive even though we had a heart attack uh, person in the, in the car. Anyway, I, did, I survived, obviously I survived. So they got me to the hospital and uh, I, having a heart attack and they put the EEG, I'm sorry, the EKG on me and, and he said, look, you've got these, uh, uh, you're shooting two T waves, uh, which means that uh, you've got a, a problem, you've got a, a problem with your heart. He said, uh, do you want uh, morphine? And I said, no, don't give me any morphine. And he said, why not? And I said, well, I don't have, I don't have that much pain. It's okay. And he said, we always give people, that's the protocol. We always give people uh, morphine. I said, well, you know, uh, Morphine doesn't work on me. You know, opiates don't work on me. They just don't take the pain away at, at all. If you shot me up with morphine, you, it would be useless. And he thought that uh, there was something wrong with my mind. So he suggested that I had a stroke because I wouldn't follow the protocol. Uh, so finally, they were going to transport me, but he didn't want to transport me unless I had uh, morphine. Uh, and uh, we compromised. He gave me TCA instead because he thought that there was that I had damage to my brain uh, because I wasn't accepting morphine and because I kept saying that morphine didn't work. And he had never run into anybody that where morphine didn't work. Well, about five percent of the world's population, uh, opiates don't work, and I'm I just happen to be one of those five percent. Anyway, they gave me a shot of TCA. It didn't, of course, it didn't do anything because I didn't have a stroke. I wasn't having a stroke. 
And I was right and he was wrong. He was just a, one of those arrogant doctors that think that they know everything. Uh, CT scan is an x-ray of a thin sliver of tissue, uh, also called a CAT scan because it's really easy to put an A in here and make it CAT. If a uh, patient is suspected of having a tumor or a stroke, a CAT scan would allow the physician to visualize the affected area. And that is exactly, that's a stroke right there. It's a picture of a stroke. Uh, whereas the angiogram and the CAT scan are both x-rays, the MRI uses radio waves and other magnetic energy to visualize the structures in the brain. <clears throat> Small changes in structure are small. As small as the myelin on individual axons can be visualized with an MRI. Magnetic uh, resonance imaging. PET scans are machines that detect radioactive activity in the brain. The radioactivity comes from radioactive impregnated glucose injected into the brain since all the cells of the body uh, are fueled by sugar. Uh, if we make it radioactive sugar, then we can see where that sugar is going. Uh, we can x-ray it. We can, yeah, we, yeah. As the various areas of the brain metabolizes glucose for their activities, the researcher is able to see which areas are active with select tasks. Uh, this guy's watching a nature video. One of these guys, this is this guy is a cocaine addict, and this guy isn't. And what they have done, they're doing a PET scan, and they're showing the, they're showing them a nature video, and as you can see, you get activation, um, both uh, the uh, addict and the non-addict, and then we are show. Then they show him a cocaine video, and you can see how much more excited this guy got than this guy did got. The uh, functional MRI uh, differs from an MRI machine in the intensity of the magnetic signal used. Because the functional MRI is so powerful, uh, it can detect minute differences in metabolism. Uh, this gives researchers a similar picture as the PET scan, but without the radioactive injection. And here we see pre-surgery. This is his tumor right here. After surgery, you can see the open area. And the speech area is not affected. Uh, I don't know why I put this in here. And that is the end of the chapter. Sorry that it took so long. Next week, we'll just tackle chapter three, probably. Uh, but uh, this gets us uh, into uh, the third week, kind of. Second week, I guess. Anyway, I'll see you next week.